for a second. Our second speaker today is Dr. Katherine Miller Jensen, who's an assistant professor in biomedical engineering. And Catherine's title today is High Throughput Secretomic Analysis of Single Cells for Systems Immunology. You can use the mouse. I, there might be a pointer on here. I don't know if it's working. Okay. Yeah, give it a shot. All right, thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. It's a real um, pleasure. And so, Again, my name is Katherine Miller Jensen. I'm in biomedical engineering, and um, I guess this talk will be a bit different than what you just heard, but um, it's a pleasure to talk to you about our efforts to develop an assay for a single cell, um, for assaying single cell secretion. So I think my first uh, subject here today would be to motivate you that cell to cell heterogeneity plays a critical role in the immune system and cancer. And so this is a really exciting time to be part of this field uh, due to the, the number of technologies that are now allowing us to interrogate cells at the single, le at the single cell level. So um, just a sampling of some recent, all within the past two years, uh, reports um, emphasizing how uh, single cells can tell us something about biology. There's a single cell mass cytometry of differential immune and drug responses across a human hematopoietic continuum. Um, there's visualization of high dimensional single cell data reveals phenotypic heterogeneity of leukemia. Non genetic origins of cell to cell variability in trail induced apoptosis. And single cell transcriptomics reveals bimodality and expression and splicing in immune cells. So this is all to say that um, we've spent many years measuring cells and populations and the idea is that we may actually be missing some important information when we do that. So then the second thing I want to um, briefly talk to you about are what are the sources and consequences of cellular heterogeneity? So here I just want to point to two, since this is partially meant to be educational, two excellent reviews, non-genetic heterogeneity and the course consequences for pharmacology and cellular heterogeneity, do differences make a difference? And these were taken from those two reviews. And I first want to talk just a little bit more about uh, sources of cellular heterogeneity. So I think most of us think about genetic heterogeneity, mutations or even epigenetic modifications that can cause cells to, be, to, to certainly be different from their neighbors. Um, and of course, we're also familiar with environmental heterogeneity. So those microenvironments of growth factors, um, temperature, pH, that might cause cells to behave differently. But what I think what's less appreciated, although we probably all know it at some level, is that there's non-genetic heterogeneity of the proteome, just natural variations in protein levels across cells. And what this means, to give you, kind of get you thinking in the single cell mindset, if you look at these, these um, uh, graphs across the bottom, the first one, the mean essentially, um, is describing a wide, just if this is the mean of a protein level, and these are the histogram of the cells expressing that protein, what you can see is there's always a tail of this protein. These always have a distribution. And in this tail, if, with enough variation, this tail could be expressing four to five times the amount of the cells in the lower, in the lower portion, which could be enough for biological differences. Even um, more pronounced would be if this mean was actually masking a small subpopulation of cells, um, such as cancer stem cells or something important therapeutically. Or finally, in a more extreme case, the mean might actually not describe either population in the, in, um, of the cells. There may actually be a bimodal, dist a, a bimodal distribution, such as you have low and high cells around a mean. So these are some of the motivations for looking at single cell technologies. And now I want to motivate you for our small um, corner of the world, where we would like to develop a state-of-the-art assay for single cell secretion. So to give you an idea of what's out there already, I've um, made a schematic of secretion functionality on the y-axis and throughput on the x-axis. So in a minute, I'll tell you what I mean by this. Um, but the, one of the most commonly used assays for measuring single cell secretion is the LE spot, where essentially cells are um, plated at a limiting distribution and surrounded by an antibody such that the secretion is captured locally. And um, this could be used, for example, to measure interference secretion in T cells. And while this is highly functional and that the cells are actually allowed to secrete, um, it's not very high throughput, and it only allows for maybe one or two targets. On the other hand, you could use multicolor flow cytometry, and in this case, you could measure three, four, even up to eight targets if you're really good at, par at um, putting together the different colors. 
However, in order to measure secretion in this assay, you need to actually block the cells with something like Perfeldin A, such that the, the um, proteins remain inside the cell. And so I would call that less, less functional, although much more high throughput. And then finally, um, more recently, is this um, technology called CYTOF mass cytometry, where they've actually combined a mass spectro spectrometry with flow cytometry. And this is allowing things to be multiplexed up to 50 plex, for example. Um, now, admittedly, this is usually used for um, things like analyzing receptors as well as intracellular proteins. One could imagine that it could also be used for secretion, but again, you have this problem where you need to block the secretion. Not to mention, both of these require um, fixing or uh, killing the cell. So there's a, there's a need um, for a functional high-throughput single-cell secretion assay. So my collaborator, um, Rong Fan, a, prof um, a professor of biomedical and engineering here at Yale, and I really want to emphasize that this was all this original assay was developed in his lab, came up with this idea that you can have a little uh, a PDMS, um, which is a type of um, polymer nanoliter um, microchamber array. So essentially, you build a small array of, of nano wells. Each well is about two microliters. <coughs> Um, and then separately on a glass slide, you can actually pattern antibodies, flow pattern antibodies. And you put them in a certain order such that the location tells you which, which is your target of interest. Then you can place the wells on top of the um, array of antibodies. And essentially now you have like a miniature ELISA. So there's actually no microfluidics in this device. It's quite easy to use. You can pipette cells on top of it and they distribute um, in the device such as you have zero, one, two, three numbers of cells. Um, and then from there, the cells are allowed to secrete for a certain amount of time. And then you can take away the uh, slide and then add on um, a secondary detection antibody uh, attached to a fluorophore and essentially read out a barcode of what your single cell has secreted. So at the end of the day, the idea is simple. If you make the volume small enough, the concentration will be high enough that you can measure um, secretion from a single cell with ELISA antibodies. So this is just a physical description of the uh, physical pictures of the device. And then here's a little example of some of the data that you might get out. So these wells are long and skinny, and you can see well one, there's one cell, well two, there's a cell, well three has no cell, etc. And then these match to the barcode that you would get after you um, add your secondary antibody. So you can see cell one is making a lot of TNF alpha, or sorry, IL-8. Cell two is making um, about four proteins. Satisfyingly, in well three, there was no cell, and therefore we don't have any um, fluorescence, um, and, and so on. Now, I will say that even though we see no fluorescence here, there is, uh, there is sometimes background fluorescence, just like in any fluorescent technology. I mean, when you use flow cytometry, you don't actually have a zero. Um, and so we can actually do histograms of our cells, similar to you do in flow cytometry, and we can use that, the zero cell data to set our threshold. So what I'm showing you here is secretion from uh, TNF-alpha, one of the proteins of interest. And the purple is our zero cell wells. And then the green is our cells that have, that have been treated, and they have one um, wells with one cell. And you can see many cells overlap with zero, but then we have a nice satisfying secretion, increase in secretion for a certain po population. Um, and this is a similar distribution um, with maybe a, a bit more of a separation for a different protein, IL-8. So we have this technology, and now the question is, we're really in a phase of um, still um, understanding how to use this technology most effectively. And there was another recent review, which I can point you to, called Single Cell Technologies for Monitoring Immune Systems. I don't mean for you to read this list, but what this list was included in the review to say that there are many factors to consider when using single cell, te single cell technologies to address a biological question. And these are all listed here. Um, but today I want to highlight two of them, and which is the two that we set out to look at um, first as we're developing and troubleshooting this technology. So two statements. First, characterizing cells in solitary confinement ex vivo may not reflect in vivo processes that result from an integrated summation of cooperative actions from many cells over time. Or in other words, cells like to be in groups. And so we'd like to understand how isolating them is changing their behavior. And secondly, single cell analysis is most useful when establishing systems level models that describe mechanisms of responses. 
And so uh, essentially then we turn these into two different questions. One, how does, how does isolating the cells change the overall response of the population or does it? Although I guess I've already told you that yes it does. And then secondly, um, can we actually develop systems level models from our single cell data? So, um, and so as our test case, we are actually using a monocytic cell line, U937, and we're treating it with, um, it's a, it's a, we differentiate it to a macrophage-like state, and then we are treating it with LPS, um, the endotoxin of gram-negative bacteria, and the ligand for TLR4. Um, and of course, the choice of this system is um, for a number of reasons, which I didn't uh, show here, but I could mention. Um, one is that it's a well-characterized system, and so it allows us to sort of test how our technology is doing. Um, also, macrophages secrete a lot, and so it's helpful when you're trying to do a secretion assay to have something that's secreting a lot. And then, um, finally, as a more biological reason, macrophages, I like to think they can, they can exist alone in the body, kind of trolling around looking for um, targets, or they can kind of come together at the site of an infection. And so we thought it might be interesting, actually, to understand how the cells are, maybe, um, how, they, how the cells are operating differently when they're alone or in a population. So normally, you know, a T an LPS TLR4 pathway would be depicted something like this, fairly linear, where there's two branches, and at the bottom of the one branch, you get pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion, and at the other branch, you get type 1 interferon secretion. But what I'd like to remind you and kind of argue is that this is really a dynamic extracellular cascade, and that after you add the LPS, some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines are secreted earlier than others, and the receptors for those pro-inflammatory cytokines exist on the same cell. And so we certainly have the chance for autocrine and paracrine signaling to be affecting our response. So again, our simple question, does the cell population reflect the sum of all the, of the single cell, the aggregate single cell response? So the first clue that that's probably not going to be the case is just looking at the diversity that we get out of the secretion in this device. So um, to show you uh, briefly here, this is the um, log 10 intensity of uh, the secretion after we've added that secondary antibody. The blue is the control, the red is LPS. These are the different cytokines we've measured, um, and chemokines, I should say. Um, each dot represents intensity from a single cell, and then here is the percentage or the fraction of cells that fall above our threshold. Okay, so 65% so, um, of the control cells are actually not secreting at all. According to our assay, 35% show secretion. And so you can see down the line. Um, so what's satisfying is that we do get increases in fraction and intensity. So the, the black line is actually the overall mean intensity, including the zero cells. So you can kind of think of that as like a population level response. And you can see that it increases for all of these targets that we expect to increase upon LPS stimulation. But what's interesting is certain things like TNF-alpha, which is thought to be one of the major factors, which is known to be one of the major factors that's activated after LPS, we still only get 38% of our cells actually secreting this. And that was somewhat surprising to us. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, then the question was, well, can we convert all of these to concentrations and essentially add up all the single cells and see, do they match what we get if we measured in the population? So we use calibration curves to do this. Um, it's a little bit noisy, but we think we have a pretty good handle on it. Oh, before I do that, I just want to say that one could argue maybe it's, our maybe it's our just our device, but we actually did similar tests We're using flow cytometry and intracellular cytokine staining, and we actually get similar um, fractions when we use that, when we use that technology. Um, so uh, we look, we, we um, added up the secretion, and we basically um, calculated a population-level secretion from the single-cell device and compared it to what we'd get on a plate. And what you can see is that for certain cytokines um, in chemokines, IL-8, CCL-5, CCL-4, and TNF-alpha, they look relatively similar. As I said, it's a, bit, it's a bit noisy when we're trying to make this conversion, but I would say that they're on the same order of magnitude. Interestingly, for something like IL-1-beta, um, we actually see a lot more than we would see in the plate. But then here is the really dramatic difference, where for these things like IL-6, IL-10, and GMCSF, which are strongly upregulated in the plate, so again on the left, we actually lose that activation almost completely in the single cell device. Um, and so, well, I shouldn't say we lose it completely, because as you can see, there were always some cells making quite a bit of each of those. But in aggregate, the cells, look, the population looks like it's lost a lot of that response. 
So here we ask ourselves, well, um, what could be causing that? And I've already mentioned that pot potentially the paracrine signaling we think might be leading to these responses. And so what we did was we, um, we actually just did a population level um, measure of the dynamics of secretion of each of these proteins. And then we clustered them based on those dynamics. And so, um, again, this, this recapitulates a lot of things that have already been known about this system. But very early on, you get CCL4, IL-8, and CCL5. And then later, in the second cluster, you get things like TNF, IL-10, GMCSF, IL-6, etc. And so we took that cluster and we compared it to clustering all of our single cell data, which I should have mentioned we took at a rather late time point, which was about 20 hours after adding LPS. And what you can see is that these clusters actually match very well, where those proteins that are secreted at a very high level across all single cells, they tend to cluster together. And those that are secreted at a, at a more low level tend to cluster, cluster together and, and match sort of this, what we think is a sort of late signaling, suggesting that perhaps they're influenced by some of the earlier proteins. Um, then to test this more directly, we can do simple, simple assays at the population level. Um, so if a cell is depending on its neighbors for signaling, we could just decrease the density and see if that affects, uh, that affects what we get out at the population level on a per cell basis. And so this is a simple assay we could have done long before our, um, long before our single cell device. And you can see that, again, these, these um, signals don't depend on um, the density, whereas these other signals, IL-6, IL-10, and TNF-alpha, actually show a dramatic drop in the amount per cell, secreted per cell. Um, when we change the cell density. And another way we can get at this is we can try to actually um, mix the cells before we block them with Profeldin A and the flow cytometry signaling assay. So if you remember, um, in the flow cytometry assay, you're actually also blocking paracrine signaling because you've kept the cells from secreting. And what you can see is it's a little bit of a, of a messier assay, but for, again, for IL-6 and IL-10, mixing those cells ahead of time sort of significantly increases the amount that we see, the percentage that are activated, whereas for the other cytokines, it's very small. Or chemokines, I'm sorry. All right, so at this point, what I've said to you is that actually, yes, isolating the cells appears to be changing um, what we would think would be the response from a population um, assay. And I think this is important for a number of reasons. We have lots of uh, lots of biology based on plate level um, assays, and so I think it's important to really understand how the two um, differ from each other. But the question is, is this a bad thing? And I'm going to argue that no, actually, I think it's not. Because if each single cell were just a faithful representation of the population, then essentially we'd have just done 100 population experiments, and we wouldn't have learned a whole lot. But what we actually did was hundreds of perturbation experiments, where each cell is exposed to a little bit less or a little bit more of the, of the different cytokines. And because of that, we can actually use statistical inference methods to try to infer networks from a single experiment. Um, so again, um, so the methods we turned to were um, graphical, Gaussian graphical models. Um, so again, these are networks where you look for partial correlations across the proteins in the assay. Um, so we had eight proteins, and so um, we had somewhere on the order, I think, of uh, 60 connections or so. Um, but what we came out was, with were um, seven significant connections. And now a, a picture emerges that's quite satisfying, if you know anything about um, LPS signaling, where we can see that um, CCL4 and these, these early proteins are connected. They actually connect to these um, IL-1 beta and TNF, which are thought to be or known to be important pair, um, signals for the downstream response. And then these actually connect down to these, what we're calling the dependent signals of IL-10, IL-6, and GMCSF. So again, what this uh, method is doing is it's taking partial correlations. So it's essentially accounting for how each protein varies when holding all the other proteins constant. And we essentially are, be able, are able then to, um, to get from our, from our single cell data um, a network that would have taken a lot more perturbations um, at the population level. I should say one interesting thing is when we tried to do this network with just the 20-hour data that I've been presenting you, we actually did not get um, as many strong connections. Um, so this, this actually includes a four-hour and an eight-hour experiment as well, because it turns out that early on, there's a lot more heterogeneity that's informative um, for how these, these things connect. And so overall, this, this is based on approximately 2,000 maybe single-cell data points. 
Okay, so then what we can do is actually test, um, now we can go back and test how um, this agrees with what we see at the population level. And so um, we went ahead and blocked TNF and we saw results that we'd expect to see based on the literature um, where IL-6 and GMCSF go down significantly whereas the other proteins do not. And then we added TNF back with LPS. But what's interesting is we actually don't see a big increase in the response when we add TNF. And here we would argue we're adding LPS at 100 nanograms per mil, which is like hitting it with a hammer. And so the chances are that in the population as a whole, adding more TNF is not going to make a difference. But as I told you, there's wide heterogeneity in the cells that are actually secreting TNF. Um, so here's a close-up of the distribution of TNF secretion in across our cells. And um, here's where we drew our threshold. So we would call these not secreting, and we would say about 25% of this distribution is secreting. And if we zoom in on that, here is the one nanogram per mil TNF, or approximately where the, the population level secretion is at. And there are some proteins that are actually making 10 to 20 times more than that population average, and then cells that even though they're secreting TNF are making considerably less. And so our hypothesis was that even if adding TNF would make no difference in the population, if we add it back to these single cells, it's quite possible that, that these low cells would benefit from that addition. And so that's what we did. We added TNF back with LPS to our um, single cell device. And again, I told you that adding TNF in the population made no difference. But here, we can actually significantly increase the fraction, the fraction of um, cells secreting each of these dependent cytokines um, when, we, when we add uh, TNF in conjunction with LPS. And this also translates into, if you tr convert this back to concentration, for example, we've rescued IL-6 concentration, we've increased it by about five-fold. So not completely rescued it from the population level, but it's going in the right direction. Um, and so the final point I want to make is just that um, we also can go in the other direction. So we noticed through many of our experiments that we had these super secretors that I like to call them of IL-6 in our, in our single cell wells. So every time we'd run an experiment, we'd always have one or two that were making, if you translate it, 100 to 200 times the lower level of, of, of what these, so these cells are secreting like 100 times what cells down here are secreting in terms of their IL-6 secretion. We thought this was extremely interesting. Uh, again, overall, only about 7% of cells are even making it. And if you look at the coefficient of variation, which is essentially the standard deviation of the secretion divided by the mean, you can see that IL-6 is much, much higher than any of the other proteins that we'd measured. And what we think that could, the, could be the reason for this is that IL-6 actually can, um, has a strong positive feedback and that IL-6 can actually activate itself. So if you block IL-6, you block um, signaling, you can, you can lower the amount of IL-6 in the population, and if you add IL-6 to LPS, you can actually increase the amount of IL-6 in the population, of course, controlling for what we've added. And so again, we think that this is another way in which paracrine signaling may actually be decreasing cellular heterogeneity by um, basically allowing that single cell, that's th that super secretor 1%, to share its resources with the other population and thus boost IL-6 secretion. So again, this is kind of a um, almost toy example, right, to see what kinds of things we can do with this technology and how to understand the data that we're getting out. Um, so I hope overall I've shown you that there's a need for medium to high throughput technologies to measure single cell secretion um, in immunity and cancer. There's populations of monocytic cells display significant cell, cell heterogeneity, even though they are supposedly clonal populations in LPS activated secretion. And these nanowell approaches provides a mean to parse autocrine versus paracrine signaling and potentially, I think most excitingly, infer these system level dependencies. And finally, we think this may be paracrine signaling or neighbor signaling may actually be a way that cells use to lower their overall heterogeneity down the line and coordinate responses in cell populations. So in the face of a lot of biological heterogeneity, um, we think maybe cell population, this is one way cell populations can control the response. So we hope for, um, we think that there's a lot of interesting future directions here. We could measure cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity and uncover systems level networks in primary immune cells. We're working on that. The culturing in this device is a little bit more complex, but we're getting there. Um, and we think especially this would be exciting to compare and um, infer networks in healthy versus diseased monocytes and macrophages from patients. Um, and finally, we're continuing to improve and um, innovate on this assay for single cell analysis. So um, 
think I need my disclosures and accreditation slide. And then um, my acknowledgments. So again, I really want to acknowledge my collaborator, Professor Rong Fan, um, and his postdoc Yao Lu in his lab, who developed the original device. Chong, who's worked very hard, a postdoc in my lab, on um, making the culture, con uh, um, optimizing culture conditions, as well as Marcus, um, a, a master's student who's done a lot of the computational work. Other members of my lab, our main funding source for this was NIH Links program, as well as um, Gates and the NSF. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to lead off the question period with just a couple of technical questions, because many of us are sitting here thinking about our favorite tumor cell <laughs> microenvironment <laughs> questions. Yeah. Uh, what is the convenient throughput in terms of number of cells? Second, um, can you recover the single cells and further analyze them, say, by immunophenotyping? And third, does this work pretty well with adherent cells? So the first question, how many cells? Um, we, you can conveniently do about, um, let's see, you can get out about 1,000 single cells in an experiment, in a condition, and then um, you can do about four or five conditions at a time. Each one requires a different device. Um, in terms of, let's see, the second question was, um, I forget, <laughs> adherent cells. I will say something about adherent cells. So macrophages actually are adherent once you differentiate them. And so um, this, is, this is the part that's, that's sort of kept us from moving forward with the primary cells at first. Um, but now we have been able to, if, you, if you're careful about the way you prepare your PDMS, you can actually culture your cells overnight in the device and then lift off and, and then basically um, tr treat them, simulate them on the device. Up until now, we've been stimulating them and then putting them onto the device. So I do think as a, there's a... And can you recover the cells? So oh, yes, you could recover the cells, yes. Actually, if they're adherent, that would make it easier because when you rip off the glass slide, they would stick. And so you could then recover it and potentially do the other single cell can assays. You do multiple measurements on the same cell over time? So that's an interesting question. So we, there, is a, there is a technology out there. It's called um, micro-engraving, where essentially you take a glass slide that's patterned with the antibodies and you could put it on and take it off and, and then put a new one on over time. So you could see, track a, the same cell and see what it secretes over time. There's some challenges there because every time you take it off, you lose more cells. Um, but yes, it can be done. And I think with the right optimization, it could be done with enough cell numbers. Yeah. So what is the reason for the heterogeneity of the cells? So different uh, gene expression or some other reasons? So I think it could be multiple reasons. Um, I've actually, surprisingly, well, we started work with primary cells, we actually see more coordinated, like we almost see less heterogeneity than with these cell lines. And I think that's because some of these cell lines are notorious for accumulating some, maybe some of the cells do accumulate actual mutations. But I think there's lots of documented evidence that it could also, a large part of it could just be variations in the proteome. Um, so that, so for example, there was a really nice, there's been a couple of nice papers recently showing that just having natural variation in the proteome, you know, every time you treat the, you know, say cells with some sort of apoptosis inducing drug, you've always got some fraction that survive. And um, something I used to work with a lot. And so it's been shown that you can actually show that those cells just have different amounts of proteins such that they're less susceptible to death at any one time and they'll kind of continually repopulate each other. So I think it's probably some combination. And, and that's what we're sort of trying to, to, to figure out. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'd like to thank both of our speakers today for terrific and really <laughs> slightly unusual talks for this venue. I, I really enjoyed them.